greetings to the Tech Sutra viewers. What uh, we would be doing in this 10 minute video is uh, I'll just take you through some of the brief text proposals which are impacting the financial services sector. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There was one demand from the industry to make a consistent tax treatment for the alternate investment funds versus the venture capital funds. I think that differentiation between tax treatments uh, does continue. So you have an AIF category one and two, which are uh, being taxed separately vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, category three. And again, you have a separate uh, tax regime for the venture capital funds. There is also some uh, rationalization of TDS provisions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, category one and category two alternate investment funds. The erstwhile provisions uh, mandated a withholding tax at 10% as and when the distribution is made to the non-resident investor uh, or as and when uh, you know there is a credit in the books of account to the non-resident investor. The new provisions uh, suggest that instead of a flat 10% TDS, uh, when the amount gets accrued in the hands of the non-resident investors, you would actually deduct TDS at the rates in force, which effectively would mean that you would look at the tax position of each of the non-resident investors separately. And wherever tax treaty benefits are due, you would provide that tax treaty benefits uh, while uh, determining any withholding tax rate. Of course, the withholding tax rate vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a unit holder where he's a resident in India that continues to be 10% and uh, he would of course be eligible to obtain a nil withholding or a lower withholding tax certificate. Uh, let us look at a couple of practical issues which can arise. Uh, so there is no specific exemption for withholding by AIF in case the exempt income distributed by an EIF to a resident unit holders is a dividend. So if you look at the scenario where a dividend is earned by a EIF category one and two, that is something which is exempt. And when that dividend is distributed to the resident investor, uh, the provisions mandate a 10% TDS, uh, you know, which would actually mean that he would need to claim a refund, which is going to be a bit of a TDS procedure. There is also a very interesting issue which arises what if uh, AIF uh, earns a share of profit from an LLP? Uh, when an AIF earns a share of profit from an LLP, that is an income which is not chargeable in the hands of the LLP, uh, even though the characterization of that income would be business income. And the, therefore, the query which arises is that when any distribution is made or any income is accrued from that portion, uh, arising from the share of profit earned from the LLP, is that something which would attract a 10% TDS? Uh, so that's that's something which I believe is going to remain and create certain issues. Also, the current budget does not prescribe any specific tax treatment for AIF category three, uh, especially hedge funds, etc. So we would need to rely on the general taxation for trusts in kind of determining their tax liabilities. One. Uh, important uh, you know requirement was that today there is a section 56 to 7b whereby any exemption uh, whereby any consideration which is you know uh, received by a company uh, for on issue of shares at a premium that is something which is exempt uh, in case of uh, a vcf so if a vcf is the investor putting in money into a company uh, at a premium that is something which does not get hit by 56 to 7b uh, but that vcf does not include aif so you know today if an aif really invests uh, money into the shares at a premium you would really need to look at it whether the valuation is appropriate in the context of that section and that could create certain challenges there is also uh, you know no clarification till now vis-a-vis -vis characterization of income of aif as capital gains that is something you know which is which was desired but i think the budget has not really touched upon that aspect uh, let's go to the next slide there is an exemption from levy of dividend distribution tax in respect of distributions which have been made by sp to uh, reit or invits this is of course to make the reit or invit structure far more attractive 
so this kind of a pass through status is being given uh, there are certain conditions and of course the condition is that the SPV which distributes the dividend to the REIT or the invit that should be an SPV in which the REIT or invit should hold 100% of the share capital or ideally it should own the requisite capital as per the directions of the government so just to give you an example is uh, if that SPV enters into uh, any specific uh, you know policy uh, benefit and that policy says that it should be owning 76% 26% should be owned by some other investor uh, then then even that 76% investment would qualify for this exemption from levy of DDT interest and dividend income from investee company uh, are exempt uh, for REITs and invits and also dividend income is already exempt in the hands of the investors now just two three points why REITs might still remain attract unattractive you know and why some reforms are required the first issue is regarding the pass through of capital gains in case of overseas investors so i don't think we have we have appropriate clarity on that and it seems that uh, you know that is something which might be taxed in the hands of a REIT or invit the second is we still do not have any exemption from stamp duty on transfer of assets this is of course is a state subject which would mean that really you would need the state's participation in making this provision far more uh, you know liberal for uh, REITs and invest third is uh, the non applicability of provisions of 50c 43ca in case of transfer of assets uh, to the trust at nominal value now that is something which has not really uh, you know happened and which would mean that uh, you know there are going to be tax challenges stamp duty challenges in respect of retail limit let's go to the next slide yes can we go to the next slide Uh, in the last budget, we had uh, uh, some safe harbor provisions uh, vis a vis certain offshore funds where an offshore fund would not be considered to have a business connection in India uh, if the fund manager is in India, subject to certain conditions, which were around 17 conditions. And of course, those conditions are extremely onerous conditions. There has been slight relaxation in this budget. Uh, the erstwhile condition suggested that that concerned offshore fund should be set up uh, in a country with which uh, India has a tax treaty. The new provisions in the budget uh, modifies that and now it could also be a fund set up in a country which has been notified by the government with which we might not have a separate tax treaty. Also, the erstwhile conditions suggested that there should be no control and management uh, of any business or the fund should not be carrying out any business uh, in India and from India. So this, this terminology of carrying out business from India was creating a problem because practically every fund would be doing business from India, if not in India. So this budget rationalizes it and that condition of from India has been deleted, which effectively would, would mean that if the fund is not carrying out any activity in India, it should of course be satisfying this condition. Uh, we also see deferral of the poem provisions by one year. So it's financial year 16, 17 now relating to assessment year 17, 18, which would now have the applicability of poem place of effective management. There is also uh, the much desired clarification uh, in the MAT provisions regarding non applicability of MAT to foreign companies. Now, this is something which is, uh, you know, a result of the AP Shah committee which was followed by a circular and now we have a retroactive amendment under the income tax act that MAT provisions uh, would not apply uh, to foreign companies in the past there is uh, an exemption from capital gain tax to non-resident on uh, account of appreciation of rupee against uh, foreign currency upon redemption of rupee denominated bond uh, the budget speech of the finance minister mentioned about relaxation in the requirement of furnishing pen by non-residents because section 206 AA has been a big headache. When you look at the bare provisions of the finance bill, the only amendment which is proposed in section 206 AA is that this uh, section would not apply vis-a-vis -vis payments of uh, interest on uh, 
funds borrowed which are covered under 194 lc effectively we are talking about ecbs so we suspect that uh, you know what has been said in the speech uh, of the finance minister might now be kind of uh, amended by way of separate rules where certain transactions might be exempted so we'll have to wait and watch for the amended rules there is uh, there was also a mention in the budget speech regarding re reduction in the period of holding for uh, characterization as long term capital asset uh, in case of unlisted companies from 3 years which was proposed last year to 2 years but we do not find any specific amendment in the finance bill i think it's a miss out and maybe when we look at the finance act uh, possibly they'll put this uh, provision into place let's go to the next slide there is a certain i would say clarification made in the provisions relating to the buyback tax the erstwhile provisions suggested that a buyback tax applies only if a buyback is made under section 77a of the companies act 1956 now we already have the companies act uh, 2013 in place so the new suggested provisions are that any buyback under any company law Uh, would now be covered under buyback tax as far as it relates to unlisted companies which would actually also mean that a buyback done under a scheme a court scheme would also qualify for a buyback tax there were certain issues as to the connotation of the term amount received by company for issue of shares uh, because uh, you know the manner of uh, computation of buyback tax was to really first look at the consideration uh, less the cost of the shares and what meant uh, by amount received by company for issue of shares was subjected to certain debates and therefore uh, the budget provisions are suggesting that they will come up with rules to kind of determine as to what do you mean by amount received by company for issue of shares so that's something which we'll have to look into it uh, you know once the rules are out there is also a welcome clarification on permissibility of uh, the beneficial 10% tax rate for long term capital gains on transfer of shares of a closely held company in case of a non resident investor there was always an issue because of the way the definition was linked to uh, securities contracts regulation act as to whether a private company can qualify as a security because in the context of scra we have many decisions to comment that the shares of a private company are not marketable and hence not covered under scra fortunately that linkage to the definition of a, of a security vis a vis that of an scra has been removed so which would typically mean that now even a normal private company which is not listed or which is not a subsidiary of a listed company that is something which should qualify for a beneficial 10% rate uh you know conversion of company into llps are uh, always onerous so that is something which uh, has been made more onerous by including an additional condition now the company which proposes to convert into an llp should not have any assets uh, exceeding 5 crore in the previous 3 year in addition to all other conditions so we would see far more complexities in conversion of companies into llps there is also an exemption now provided from capital gains tax on uh, transfer of any units in case a uh, couple of plants of mutual fund schemes merge Uh, and and you know new units are issued so that's a welcome clarification one uh, measure which has kind of i would say dampened the stock market initially is the levy of uh, 10% tax on dividend income earned by shareholders resident shareholders which are individuals hufs and firms in case they receive dividends uh, in excess of rupees 10 lakhs and of course in computing the quantum of 10 lakhs uh, you should exclude dividends received from mutual funds aifs treats and invests so it would typically be the corporate dividends but if a holding company or if a investor which is a corporate entity is receiving the dividends uh, from uh, a particular company then it does not need to pay an additional tax of 10% it is finally when the recipient shareholder is only an individual hf and firm uh, and the amount is in excess of 10 lakhs would you really apply this additional levy of 10% tax next slide complete pass through uh, status has been accorded to securitization trust you know this is only really to kind of give more impact as to new vehicles like rits invits securitization trust so i think that's a very welcome move you also have now a standard deduction available to nbfcs 
for uh, provision for bed and doubtful debts to the extent of 5% of the total income. Uh, NBFCs have always been demanding a parity in tax treatment vis-a-vis uh, -vis banks. So I, I would say this is a welcome start. You also have the incentives uh, given for eligible startups. And uh, uh, you know there are a couple of points uh, in that. First is uh, while the startup policy announced by the government included a company as well as an LLP, the tax proposals put in by the finance minister only refers to a company so as to be eligible for startup benefits. That's the first point. Uh, if it's a miss, maybe they'll amend it before the finance bill uh, is legislated into an act. Uh, second point is that uh, the benefit is in the form of 100% uh, of deduction of profits for uh, three out of five years. And uh, of course, MAT would be applicable. So effectively, even if you're claiming uh, this uh, tax holiday, you would still be subjected to MAT. There is a, a condition that this eligible startup cannot be formed by way of splitting up and reconstruction of an existing business, which would mean that you cannot just shift an old business uh, into a new company uh, and then start taking a benefit of uh, the startup uh, incentive plans. Also, there are a couple of other uh, incentives which are being provided. For example, there is an exemption from capital gain. If, if the gains are invested in funds recognized by government for startups or if the funds are invested in shares of a company which uh, uh, you know qualifies uh, as small or medium enterprise uh, so, so that's a welcome I would say move uh, in that sense so you also have uh, you know some impact is being given uh, to affordable housing project which I think would uh, you know really encourage uh, mushrooming of a lot of uh, uh, real estate uh, funds uh, focusing on uh, such affordable housing basically uh, it refers to a project which has been approved uh, by a competent authority between june 2016 to march uh, 2019 the benefit is in the form of deduction of 100 percent of profits uh, from this uh, approved projects and of course the project should be approved uh, within three years from the date of approval so let's say theoretically the project has been approved in march uh, 2019 in that case, the project should be completed uh, by March 2022 and the profits which are being earned from that project, uh, that is something which uh, you will be eligible for tax holiday. Uh, MAT would be applicable on, on such profits. Uh, we go to the next slide. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, certain tax incentives which have been introduced uh, to the International Financial Services Center. We have right now one in uh, Gandhinagar, uh, Ahmedabad, Gujarat, basically the gift city. And uh, this is basically to make such international financial services center far more popular and uh, you know globally competitive. The first benefit is uh, exemption from levy of dividend distribution tax uh, to companies located in such international financial services center. I think a very, very attractive uh, benefit. Second is the MAT rate has been reduced to 9% uh, on these companies. Uh, that again would be, I would say, very attractive compared to you know what you normally pay MAT at uh, eighteen and a half percent. There is also an exemption from levy of STT on uh, the transactions happening in foreign currencies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis sale of shares, units, uh, commodity uh, derivatives. So that's something which is going to really uh, reduce the cost of doing transaction in uh, IFSC. And there is also an exemption uh, from long-term capital gains on transfer of uh, such assets, uh, you know, where the gains are arising in foreign currency. So all in all, uh, you know, the budget seeks to kind of create an attractive tax regime for uh, units which are functioning in the International Financial Service Center. Uh, this is uh, all uh, we go to the next slide, but I think this is all we have uh, a brief snapshot uh, as to you know what does the budget provide for uh, in uh, 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 the current uh, tax proposals uh, which might impact the financial services center. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, many thanks uh, for uh, attending this small uh, webcast. Thank you.